This video on Relentless Descent into Madness is brought to you by Raycon. This past month has taken a toll on us all. Our lives have been drastically altered with the whole shelter-in-place deal, not knowing what tomorrow will bring, and no live sports. There are many of us that are slowly losing our minds with cabin fever and delirium, but with the everyday E25s, you can at least get crisp, quality sound and booming bass while doing so. See how this disheveled Yinzer looks as he tries on one of the many colors these wireless earbuds come in. He may look like death itself, but with seamless Bluetooth connectivity and a price point at half of other major brands, it's fantastic. Even as he ponders life in quarantine, you can hear his borderline insanity for 15% off your purchase. All you have to do is go to buyraycon.com slash utree to claim this special offer. If you're going to lose your mind at this time, at least be comfortable doing so. That's where Raycon comes in. Music does help to heal the soul, you know. Now on to the rambling. A world without sports. It sucks. Quarantine isn't meshing well with our way of life. We are entitled as hell, I want my amenities I took for granted back. I want the gym. I want mindless eating out of generic chain restaurants. I want live sports. I'll even take the pirates. Yeah, even then. They're a decent night out for the price when all things are considered. Even with social distancing, it's still viable. Nobody in this town goes to their games on a weeknight anyways. That's why they pay me the big bucks. I'll be here all night. Where was I? Oh yeah, the pirates. Last time I bitched about them, they had just traded away two franchise cornerstones, cementing the spiral back into irrelevance and pretending they were competitive. What happened since then? If only it were that simple. I want the drugs pirates management were on. It'll allow me to become far more optimistic about everything in the world. Normally this would be a situation I wouldn't discuss, but, well, let's just say reality smacked them right in the face. It didn't seem like so in the beginning. At the start of the 2018 season, the Pirates were merely spinning the tires of futility in the hopes that they'd get out of the mud. It had worked about as well as you could expect it to. By mid-June, everything was looking quite dire. Perhaps this would be the catalyst for much-needed change to adapt to baseball? You probably know that answer by now. The Pirates won on an 11-game winning streak before the All-Star break, including a five-game series sweep of the Brewers. In hindsight, this merely delayed the inevitable. Even as they were pulling off victories, deep down I couldn't be happy. I knew it at the time I saw it happen. It was the worst possible scenario for them. This tear would delude management into thinking that they were closer to being playoff contenders than they actually were. But even then, I figured it would be smaller pieces to bolster the lineup, not two of the top trade chips on the market at the time. Keona Kella from the Rangers at least made sense. The Pirates always embraced an elite bullpen, and the price for him wasn't truly exorbitant. There's precedent there. However, there is the issue of the main prize. And by God, was it delusional. Chris Archer, the new face of the Pirates' ambitions, brought into shore up what was seen to be a quality starting rotation. It was even worse than I feared. They weren't just buying into their delusions, they were swimming in them. It wasn't the idea of buying a huge piece, it's just how completely out of character it was. Neil Huntington, one of the more conservative GMs in baseball, a man who would rather cut off his own hand than deal significant futures, suddenly decides now is the time to grossly overpay for a pitcher who hasn't had elite production in three years. It's not the idea of buying that was concerning, but going all in for what was, in all intents and purposes, a mediocre baseball team. Even as Archer didn't return to his old form in Pittsburgh, that wasn't what made this deal catastrophic. Now, I'm not going to bitch about them dealing Tyler Glass now for him. He was never going to develop here thanks to their one-size-fits-all pitching approach and he desperately needed a change of scenery. No, the real problem was in giving up Austin Meadows. He was seen as the center fielder of the future, yet they just traded him after a cup of coffee in the bigs. And for a guy who was seen as more hype than not, it was insanity. You know the rest. Both Glass now and Meadows are developing into legitimate franchise-leading talents in Tampa Bay, just as I had feared would happen. Even more insulting, the Pirates added a player to be named later in the deal. It just happened to turn into a top 100 pitching prospect in Shane Boz, a former first-round pick of the team. I have nothing against Chris Archer, but that trade is always going to hang over him while he's here. The only way it would have been justified is if we got his 2015 form, and let's just say that hasn't happened. He's an Italian restaurant serving up endless meatballs on a weeknight. Home runs galore. Don't gaze at the dingers you hit, though, or else he'll retaliate. He'll fit in nicely. Although for all the noise they made that year, it led to what we thought was impossible. Finishing over 500. Much rejoicing was had. Woohoo. You're mediocre. Congratulations. Even then, we all knew the offseason was going to be the true test for them. Would they back up their previous big trades? The answer was a resounding no. They did next to nothing. The prize free agent signing was a Lonnie Chisinau that has the misfortune of having the durability of a Fabergé egg. He didn't even play a game for the Bucks in the 2019 season because, wait for it, injuries. The result was more patchwork. 
Melky Cabrera and Francisco Liriano on spring training invites. That's the great answer we need. It's another sign of having no real vision. They made two huge splashes at the trade deadline, yet treated the offseason as if they were merely trying to shore up a basement dweller. There's being too smart for your own good and pretending you're smart by being checkmated on the first turn. Say hello to Pittsburgh. Even then, they would try to keep pace, mostly because the rest of the division kept running itself over with a truck, but reality told us that it was merely a mirage. A strong majority of the hitters were playing eons over their heads and were due for a rather ugly regression. The starting pitching was held together by string and the bullpen was rather top-heavy. Guys they were counting on just got injured to hell and never came back. Francisco Cervelli and the eternally frustrating El Cofe come to mind here. Something had to break one way or the other. The Pirates couldn't keep this up for long. Either they had to emerge or would outright fall apart. One of these things ended up happening. Can you take a wild guess as to what that was? Go ahead, I'll wait. Or not. Just amplify the falling apart by about 20 and you get yet another monumental collapse. The third big one in this decade, in fact, and it was mighty special as well. When you lose 24 of 28 with multiple soul-crushing losses and outright slaughters throughout, it is more than a death sentence to a season. It's quite possibly the guillotine for an entire administration. Even I was surprised by how quickly they fell apart. I honestly expected a gradual taping to reality, not a violent crash down into the depths. But it couldn't just be on the field, it happened off of it as well. It was a family feud with no remorse. Keone Kelly got pissed at the bullpen coach for violating some random rule the Pirates had. Cal Crick got pissed at Felipe Vasquez for alleged preferential treatment, and Clint Hurdle tried to wash it all off with double bubble wrappers. They were more known last year for trying to fight the Reds on the field. A great strategy for trying to take Moscow, but not exactly for winning games. It did give us some rather intense brawls, at least. Even then, Chris Archer somehow looks bad during it. There was also the effort to try and trade Felipe Vasquez that ended up going nowhere. Sorry, Neil, as much as we may want it, the Dodgers weren't going to part with Gavin Lux for him. Trust me, I wanted him traded at the deadline no matter what. An elite closer like Vasquez on the Pirates is like driving a McLaren through Manhattan. A luxury good. You can at least build off of the return he would bring back no matter what. But still Huntington wouldn't budge from his demands and the deal was off. I hate life. They say they can try again in the offseason, but the dude is a Tommy John candidate waiting to happen. Something will totally fuck his trade value to hell and back. And, and... Of course he's a degenerate, why wouldn't he be? Dear God, I wish it was Tommy John at this point. To hell with the trade value, go to jail. Get the fuck to jail, you sick fuck! So if the Tommy John didn't happen to him... Oh no. Tyone needed it again? Come on, hasn't this guy suffered enough in his baseball career? Just let him pitch to his abilities and be done with it. Don't treat him like Job. So there go the Pirates' two best pitchers in the blink of an eye. During this whole time, though, management chose to double down and remain stubborn about their approach. They did nothing wrong. Their special analytics showed them that it was the way to success. They would ramble on about how they're still in the playoff hunt, technically speaking, and how 10,000 simulations would show that the Bucks only went 4 and 24 eight times in that sample size. You're missing the whole point, Neil. In the real world, you went 4 and 24. It's nothing but goddamn excuses for what we all saw for years. You can't stretch out past success to try and do nothing in the future. In their comments, they'd always talk about 2012 and how people wanted them gone after that collapse, but here's the thing. I didn't want you fired back then. That team had the potential with stars and prospects coming up on the horizon. Now I do because there's nothing showing me that you're the right man moving forward. Despite the disaster, there was still the dread that the excuses would be brought and nothing would happen. It was even worse when Clint Hurdle came out and said that he had assurances that he still had a job next season. After which management called him out on his bluff and sent him to be pine tarred and feathered. Yet Neil Huntington was going to be staying put and I slowly died on the inside. Yet it kind of felt like Bob Nutting was less of a cut nugget and decided on Frank Coonley being shown out as Huntington was conducting interviews for the manager opening. Before he was also shown the door. As messed up as the timeline was, at least the Pirates did the right thing in the end. They were a triumvirate that allowed the game to pass them by and not only refused to adapt to it, but doubled down on their methods. All three of them honestly should have been fired two or three years ago. The fact that it was allowed to keep on for this long is rather telling, but that's just yelling into a void. It's a sad reality in the sports world. The heroes of yesterday sometimes become the villains of tomorrow. And that's what happened here. But you want to know the worst part of it all? The collapse they had last year was the best thing that could have happened to them. It's depressing to think about, but look at it this way. If they don't have that awful 4-24 swing, the Pirates finish with about 80 wins again, they still think they can win with the management crew and roster they have and nothing changes. It's a vicious cycle of being competitive, one of the more painful punishments in the sports realm. Not entirely terrible, but can only be relevant if every single thing breaks right. 
For the Pirates, this did not happen whatsoever. So now they get what was merely delay. Looking square in the face of another rebuild. I won't judge the new hire since they need time to see what they can do, but trading Starling Marte honestly had to be done. The man had the most complete season of his career last season, but two years of that won't be anywhere near enough to make them a playoff contender. It sucks, but trading him for high-risk, high-reward prospects was the right move. The only thing at this point is to keep going. If you're going to rebuild, strip it down and do it right. No half measures. Let the young guys play and see what they have, because you can't look me in the eyes and tell me this team will be competitive. You can't! Not without their two best pitchers. It just stings because when I look at the Pirates teams from 2013 to 2015, they don't even feel like they were in the short-term past. They feel like a distant memory like the early 90s teams nowadays. It's even worse when the guys who had middling or no success in Pittsburgh move elsewhere and develop into what they were supposed to be. It's what I saw a ton of as a kid and it still hurts to watch. At least there's Brian Reynolds, but his Babbitt was insane last season. If he can mold into a solid starter though, I'll be fine with it. I don't know why I bother, I should be cynical in these situations because... well... A pirate, a pirate, just got a pirate has been tossed, and here comes Amir Garrett. He's leaving the mound. He wants a piece of somebody. Amir Garrett takes a swing and gets a punch. The Pirates' bench is emptied. And punches Amir are Garrett being went thrown. flying, and they are hitting each other punches all over the place. This, this is not This usually. is a real fight. This Derek is not a Dietrich pushing. involved. There are punches being thrown. Somebody got a haymaker from Amir Garrett. 